Abda'u bismillahi warrahmani Wa birrahimi da'imil ihsani Al-Hadith al-Thamin An Ibn Umar radiyallahu anhuma Anna Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam qal أمرت أن أقاتل الناس حتى يشهدوا أن لا إله إلا الله وأن محمد رسول الله ويقيم الصلاة ويؤت الزكاة فإذا فعلوا ذلك عصموا مني دماءهم وأموالهم إلا بحق الإسلام وحسابهم على الله تعالى this hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam uh, wherein the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said I have been commanded to and uh, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is not mincing his words he is saying uqatil an nas to fight with the people until they bear testimony that there is no God but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and they establish the salah and they give the zakah and once they do this once they accept Islam and they fulfill all of this asamu minni dima'ahum wa amwalahum their blood and their, their wealth is haram upon me they have saved it uh, Islam, except with the right of Islam and the right of Islam is um, is hudud so if they do something that uh, that mandates a divinely legislated punishment then that punishment will be carried out وحسابهم على الله and uh, it is their reckoning will be with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so uh, this um, Imam al-Nawawi rahimahullah he is uh, um, you know one thing that we realize is that uh, we are not uh, ashamed in any way or we are not uh, you know we don't hide this in any way that the principle of jihad and the belief in the concept of jihad is something that exists in Islam and by jihad I don't mean jihad al -asghar, I mean the actual fight the armed conflict jihad uh, but there are prerequisites for the establishing of this uh, the, uh, this this jihad and the first prerequisite is that this jihad is uh, the call to jihad is going to be made by the legitimately elected uh, khalifa to muslimin he the khalifa is the only person who has the authority to issue a call to jihad and uh, the last call to jihad was issued by the Ottomans uh, because he was the Khalifa and he had the authority to issue a call to jihad, a call to arms. So it's not just, you know, uh, anybody who, you know, that's uh, a group of four or five of us decided, you know, let's go. Well, you know, this is that's not jihad because that's that's going to become a mockery and a joke. The jihad requires a preparation and a person of authority to be at the helm issuing this call. And, uh, you know, in a utopia, there would be no fighting at all. That, you know, there would be no need to fight. But we all know that th the, this is not the way the world works. And in fact, this is the hypocrisy of the West, where they can wage all the wars that they want. And yet, you know, when it comes to the Prophet ﷺ and his companions, they would say that Islam was spread by the sword. That, you know, up until very recently, you know, just maybe uh, not even a hundred years ago, you know, every country was actually, you know, constantly concerned with, uh, with their neighbors. That's uh, two concerns, that when are they going to be invaded by their neighbors or when are they going to get the opportunity to invade their neighbors. So this, uh, you know, don't pretend like it didn't exist, that in even Canada, up until you know fairly recently Canada was always worried about their neighbors uh, the United States that you know when are they going to come over here and take a province or two so <laughs> and uh, you know maybe we might uh, have to become worried again so uh, this you know war and you know even in the West we have what we call the just war um, theory so it's not something that's uh, that that's uh, we're not speaking in a vacuum every every country and you know every society from the time of Sayyidina Adam alayhi salam until today believes that there are certain causes that are worth dying for because that's that's just the way you know there there's only 
until in extent that we can accept you know uh, other ways of doing things but everybody agrees that there are certain things in this world that are worth dying for and putting your life on the line i'm sure all of us will agree and uh, you know the entire community muslim or non-muslim would agree that if an enemy is invading your country your country is something worth dying for and people have died for in the hundreds of thousands for their country because they believe that this is something that is worth dying for the protection of your country and, and its sovereignty is something that is worth putting your life on the line for. So the same way there are certain things in Islam that we believe are worth putting your life on the line for. So jihad and you know another uh, the, um, misinterpretation of the concept of jihad is that jihad is only a defensive jihad. So this is actually false. That uh, you know, and uh, history bears testimony to this. That jihad is not only a defensive jihad. That uh, we don't only believe that you know, once you are attacked, then only you can initiate. That that is also false. We do believe in an offensive jihad. Yes, do we believe that jihad is mandated uh, for us sitting here in the West? No, because we are uh, mustaminin. We are people who, we are citizens of this country and, uh, uh, and our allegiance to this country is, is an allegiance of peace. Uh, that we will remain here as peaceful citizens of this country because we have been granted the right to stay here. And uh, you are free to stay here in Islam as long as you are freely able to practice the tenets of your faith. So if there does come a time and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not show us or our children this day that you know you are refused uh, the right to perform your salah in this country then that is the day that we pack our bags and we go elsewhere. The hijrah becomes something that is uh, that is mandated on you and uh, obligated on you at that time. Even at that time because you have uh, you have basically a treaty with the country that you are residing in that you will uh, you are peaceful law abiding citizens uh, even if if they refuse you the right to perform salah you're not going to fight with them that's not the ruling that you know you take up arms against the country in which you're uh, which you're living the ruling at that time is you leave because that is that was your contract with the country that you're not that you will be a, a peaceful citizen so the ruling at that time is not that you know uh, if uh, uh, you know if a country refuses you the right to perform the salah that you get up and you 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 take up arms against that country that's not the ruling the ruling is you leave you perform hijrah from that country because that country is no longer a place where you can uh, where you can practice your faith and uh, the land of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is far and it's large and uh, you go to somewhere where you are free to practice your faith but that is when uh, the, the the tenets of your faith come into question and jihad is is an obligation it is a holy obligation and you know while you are not required to go for jihad uh, it is uh, uh, you know it would be a lie to say that uh, it is not a requirement for you to feel uh, that uh, you, you know that feeling towards jihad that you know if the time does come in my life where there is a legitimate need for me to put my life on the line i will be ready to do that that is something that every muslim must have in their hearts that if there is a legitimate call and a need for me to put my life on the line for the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then I will do that and I am ready to do that. And so uh, jihad is something that is not uh, as simple as uh, this hadith. And uh, primarily jihad, uh, you know, of course there are steps. First of all, it must be uh, the elected ruler of a Muslim country, um, uh, of the Muslims. And uh, second is there are steps to be taken before this. So it's not just, you know, okay, let's go. We're, we're going on jihad and we're going and killing everybody that is uh, coming in our way. So before the jihad actually begins, there are things that take place. So for example, the very first is the offering to accept Islam. So you accept Islam and we will not touch you. Anybody who accepts Islam will be safe. You don't want to accept Islam, then you accept that you will be citizens of this country and you pay tax in return for your protection. So the Islamic State is the, the uh, not that Islamic State, the, uh, the, the Islamic State, uh, a real Islamic State would be the only place where a non-Muslim citizen is not required to take arms uh, for the defense of that country. And there have been instances in the history of the Muslims where this tax and jizya was returned because the Muslims, they felt that they 
they could not fulfill their obligation of protecting these uh, tax-paying citizens of theirs. And the third is if they refuse both of these, then and only then will the armed conflict take place. And the armed conflict has lots and lots of rules. And you know, these rules we find in the hadith of the Prophet wasallam that you are not to kill a woman, you are not to kill a child, you are not to kill somebody who is not actively on the battlefield fighting you. لا تسمموا أبار عدوكم. Don't poison the wells of your of your enemies. So you know, poisoning of wells and cutting off of water supplies is something that you know, um, regardless of how many Geneva Conventions we have, that still happens. It still happens today. So this was the the law of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم. So this is. Uh, this is, uh, uh, you know, this is, pr and you know, if we look uh, throughout the life of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, how many people actually died in armed conflict? The number is far, far, far less than even one of uh, of these unjust wars waged by the West on uh, uh, on the East. So this is uh, this is jihad in a nutshell for you. Of course, there are many other rulings associated with this. Yes. I heard before that this the statement umirtu and uqatilu like because the purpose of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi was putting it in the first tense according to him. Um, like somebody said that it, it relates to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Is that incorrect? Or? Well, uh, this was the same hadith that was used by Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala when he waged war against those uh, who refused to pay the zakat. So not necessarily, but yes, somebody who is in uh, the position of authority as the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was in the position of authority, not the general Muslims. So the general Muslims, you know, if, if your entire neighborhood that is full of Muslims refuses to pay zakat, you will still not fight with them. Uh, because it's not your job to do that. It is the job of, uh, of the legitimately elected Muslim ruler. Uh, and uh, he has the authority to issue a call to jihad. And, uh, you know, Many things happened uh, in, in our history where uh, the ruler did not issue a call to jihad. Because jihad is not something, you know, once the, the elected ruler of the Muslims, he issued, and you know, el by election, I don't, it's not a democracy. The, uh, the way that uh, the, the Muslim ruler is elected is not by the masses, but uh, oh, the people who are known as Ahlul Hilli Wal Aqd, the people who have a sound understanding of their faith are known for their knowledge and piety. These are the people who put the, uh, the ruler of the Muslims into, into place, and uh, he is there for life. So he's not there for four years, he's not there for eight years, he's not there for two years. He's he is there until he he dies and his successor takes over. So um, there have been many problems in our Khilafah, but jihad was something that was never taken lightly. Because once the call to jihad is, is issued, then it becomes an obligation for the Muslim and not even the Ahlul Kitab. So the Ahlul Kitab, they were left alone in the Arabian Peninsula. So there were Nasara in Najran. Uh, the Yahud of Medina, they were, uh, they were expelled, but uh, uh, not because of this hadith. They were expelled for different reasons. Uh, their expulsion was, uh, was a result of treason. So uh, that's, that's an entirely different uh, story. Uh, yes. Well, see, uh, uh, that's actually a different because he's calling upon the people to support their legitimately elected government. So uh, that's not uh, political dissent. That's supporting the people that you did put into power. So, uh, and you know, um, the West does have a problem with the current uh, uh, government in Turkey, and this problem exists for various reasons. Um, uh, I'm not saying that Amir and uh, the president of Turkey is, is perfect, but he is, uh, he is perhaps the best person for the job right now. Uh, he is in touch with his, uh, uh, with his deen and he has lifted many of the restrictions that were placed upon uh, the Turkish people in, uh, in previous uh, uh, eras. So, um, Protect um, 
the current government who is... Yes, so one should participate in that because you are protecting uh, the people you put into power. So that is actually uh, So you are, uh, okay, as a tourist, I wouldn't advise that. <laughs> uh, not, yes, you are still a Muslim, but... Uh, you know, supporting uh, a political demonstration of that nature could uh, could put your life at risk, and it could also uh, it could create many complications for you. So you're not participating in uh, in that would be regarded as uh, what we would call ahwanul uh, baliyatain, the the lesser of uh, of two evils. Uh, that if you do participate in that and you get caught in the wrong place at the wrong time, then it's going to it's going to create havoc for you and your family. So uh, personally, I wouldn't advise. Uh, participating in any political demonstrations uh, in the Middle East or uh, in any other country except for yours. Also, is, wasn't that be a violation of the Ahad that you made with Canada? Uh, uh, yes, that would also be a violation of of, of your your peaceful treaty with uh, the the country where where you reside. So uh, there are there are a few things that uh, you must take into consideration before you do that. Yes, brother. I was yeah. gonna just reflect that, like, if you think about this hadith, like, in light of the Prophet being mercy to the world, if you think about it, the world's way better than it was back then, and like the right, right so like because of this concept, or, like, because the people who made jihad of this have weren't. Like, you know, the people who are doing it in Iraq right now, like they're merciful people, loving people. If you think about it, like, it's, it's, a, it's just my own reflection, I should have just kept it to myself, but like, if you think about it, this concept, like, has really allowed the world to become civilized and, like, you know, I know it's not a perfect world, there's a lot of problems right now, but if you really, like, con if you were to, like, contrast the life of an average person, like, you know, 1400 years ago versus the average life of a person, like, if, this this what a lot of think of part of this because of this uh... no one thing you should reflect on is uh, if you look throughout history occupying forces were usually not able to change uh, people so you know uh, take a look at india for example india was was under british occupation for for uh, uh, about a century and uh, they were not able to change the culture of the people, they were not able to change the ways of the people, the language of the people, the religion of the people, because this was an oppressive occupation, that uh, they were not welcome guests. Whereas you look at everywhere the Sahaba they went as a result of the Jihad, and everywhere people began to love them, they changed their language. That you know, uh, Iraq, uh, Iran, all of these places, they didn't speak Arabic, that wasn't their language, but they grew to love the people that that brought them the freedom uh, and uh, this is uh, this is just a point to reflect that you know if in reality these were an oppressive people and these jihads were oppressive campaigns then these people wouldn't have uh, you know the first chance they got they would uh, they would try to uh, to expel uh, these people and uh, we learn this from our own mistake in uh, in spain that uh, if you look at Spain and you contrast that with, let's say, the subcontinent, so that whole region of India, Pakistan, so the Muslims were in charge of both of these areas of this world for an extended period of time. Yet what was happening in Spain was there was a sense of uh, this, this Arab pride. So the, the Spanish were, the Arabs, they considered themselves to be, to, uh, to be superior in lineage and they wouldn't really associate with the Spanish. And whereas in India, um, the, the Muslims uh, who were in charge of India, they weren't Indian. Uh, they, they came from somewhere else, but they did not consider themselves superior uh, to, uh, to the people who they were in charge of. Uh, they, were, uh, you know, they would mix with them, there was a lot of da'wah going on. Uh, tasawwuf uh, played an essential role in the spread of Islam in, uh, uh, in the subcontinent. So both of these places, uh, eventually they fell out of Muslim control. But if you look at the difference between both of these places, when Spain fell out of Muslim control, it also took much of the Muslim influence with it. Of course, it didn't take all of it. Even today, there is Islam in Spain. But when India fell out of Muslim control, Islam still stayed and it flourished and it's still there today. So. Uh, 
when done right, it, it serves the purpose of humanity. Both of these places, they were, you know, they were conquered as a result of jihad, but the, you know, what followed afterwards was, was vastly different. Uh, we see many incidents uh, of, uh, you can even call it racism, uh, from the Arabs uh, that, uh, you know, post-conquer of, uh, of Andalus and Spain, and uh, from uh, India. So this is also something to to reflect on, and uh, may Allah Subhanahu wa Taala give us uh, a, a better understanding of this, and may Allah Subhanahu wa Taala give us the true and uh, proper understanding of these hadith. Inshallah, I hope to.